Okay, um, I hope you can hear me loud and clearly. So welcome back to our keynote this afternoon. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Nigor Nitra, who came up here to Durham uh, from London. So he's a professor um, at the UCL, University College London. And also, as we have learned yesterday during this group presentation, he's also affiliated with uh, Adobe Research. Uh, Nilo Nitra did undergraduate studies at IIT and a master and PhD at Stanford University together with Dean uh, Jess Lucas over there. Um, he later basically went to IIT as a professor, as assistant associate professor at Kaus, and now he is, as I said before, a professor at uh, UCL, where he's heading the Smart Geometry Group. This is also the name of his ERC grant, so he is really dealing with the acquisition and the processing of 3D geometry, and we are more than happy to have him here today to talk about this research. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic, for the introduction, and thanks, everyone. Hopefully, you have a good trip up the castle, and uh, we, I'll, I'll try to point to one thing that will be a quiz, how, how uh, well we saw the um, so uh, I'm Nilay Mitra, and I work on geometry processing, and of late I'm, I'm developing uh, machine learning frameworks for uh, geometry where there is a structure, and I'll explain what structure is. Uh, I come from University College London, so this is uh, some work we, this was a lecture, which is good. Yeah, some <laughs> work we did a few years back, where this is a scan of um, the area around Power Street where our old office was. And this shows the utility of having uh, the ability to detect symmetries and structures and objects that you can do very large scale creation, create procedural models, not only the geometry, but also the appearance, right? So this has long been a goal. And there's many people here who have been looking at digital twins and trying to build this, as Sean Kate Bjorgers, he wants to build this well for Nicosia. So this is historically a very att attractive topic to build on. And the question uh, is, are we getting closer to this? So this is one aspect of, can you hear? Can you not hear me? Not loud enough. Is it working? I think maybe it needs to yeah. be. Uh, but you can hear me in the room, I think. Yeah. If the last show is nodding, that's a good sign. Um, you can't hear me? Uh, yeah, so. it, uh, then I can switch, is the problem, but I think it should be able to speak on. Um, <clears throat> so, so this is about acquisition, and I'm going to talk about something else, because this happens to be my first uh, SCA. Uh, I know people have been here for many, many years. This is my first one. And the goal here is to do animation, right? Now, I come from a geometry background. And if you talk about papers, like we have actions and other things, these are what we in geometry we call developable surfaces. It's very well studied back from the days of Gauss, and we have very good discrete models. We can build and design from this. So this is um, a work we did a few years back, where the goal is trying to come up with the geometric model of animation. And the goal, the end goal is to create this lotus. And you see some um, magical thing going on. It's Holds by itself. There's no magnet or anything going on. There's very thin strings. It's kind of a glorified umbrella, if you will. Uh, so you see this very thin string being pulled through the side, and that sort of pulls this shape together, right? And here we could come up with a geometric uh, model of this because I don't know physics. So I come up with the geometry and that allows us to fabricate or create shapes. Right? Um, so keep this in mind because then we found out that it doesn't work beyond um, beyond uh, developing surface. I will talk about the work I'm going to talk about is, uh, is done by by my group. So this is a, a picture with great memories because this is the first time we got together as a whole group after COVID. So there's many happy faces. We're still getting used to meeting people in person, so it was great. And two or three of these people I saw first time in person because we joined at COVID. So the girl next to me, Mong, uh, I will primarily talk about her work here. So what we do in the group is what I call neurosymbolic model, where the goal is use, using machine learning to do generative models. 
but we really like procedural models, models that we can continue to edit in current geometry processing toolbox or other toolbox. So the output is something that um, modeling systems can uh, take care of. So series of work we have done on uh, shapes where the outputs are programs which when executed gives cat shapes. So that's one family of uh, shapes where the um, shapes or shape programs comes from Stinney's uh, shape grammar work. Then another type of shapes or uh, languages is language or vector graphics. So the output of the generative models are the commands you see here. Uh, these are uh, commands for the zero curves, which when you uh, give to Illustrator or Jim, would know how to get the SVG out of it. Uh, you can also interpret sketches. So this is a uh, sketch. The color denotes a timeline of the sketch. So this whole thing is parsed and executed as these four or five commands. So you find out what the author is doing and then you can execute it to get the chat. So that's part of the generative models we do. And I really like about this is it allows us to think about the machine learning aspect because it's the output is not um, images, the outputs are programs. So you have to come up with different ways of thinking and it involves uh, differentiable rendering or uh, differentiable image formation models that allows us to differentiate through the whole process. Uh, but today I'll talk about one aspect that is of particular interest to this community, which is Avatar. Um, I told uh, Rachel that it's a bit depressing after hearing a talk because all the stuff we do about appearance, we found is, is not important. It's motion which is important. So in, in this case, there's a lot of appearance going on. There's a hair, uh, there's a face, um, there's a pose, and there's also the garment, but there is motion. And this talk is about the motion of the garment. Um, just as, a, as what, what is the state of the art in, in faces, so we did this work last year, which is now integrated in part of Photoshop, uh, which is you can do a lot in faces, and by lot is uh, very photorealistic 3D effects, like change in illumination, change in camera, etc. by essentially skipping the 3D, which is again uh, a sad news for us, by working in the image domain and working in, in suitable non-linear parts in latent space. So this is a work done in collaboration with Coast, where we would find non-linear parts in Skygan spaces that allows uh, semantic editing. So here it's uh, illumination changes. You look on that one, you see the, the light being changed. Here it's a pose and it is etc. So this is uh, very compelling, and you can do a lot with Skygan like image based. And the reason it works, it's all aligned. So we don't need generalization to new types of faces. These are still human faces. But, um, but now when we go to avatars, our um, characters, there is the 3D dynamics, and there is the 2D appearance of the character. Right? And let's go back from my napkin case, which is what we had, uh, to this type of case, which is like a fabric, or something to be read. And now, um, it's not simple anymore, the geometry, but things start stretching, the material is different. And one of the grand goals we set ourselves like about four years back is if I observe a piece of fabric under interaction, can I learn from that, build a physical model, and then incorporate it in a simulation so that we can do that. So that's the whole goal we are trying to pursue. We have made some inroads to this problem and I'm going to talk about aspects of that today. Okay, so that's the that's fact. So what are the challenges? One challenge is, uh, as I already mentioned, this gap between synthetic and real data, because uh, we have uh, synthetic data means we are using some synthetic model and then a developable model or some as rigid as possible, we are creating this, right? And in the real, there is a difference. That's the geometric part. There's also an appearance difference. And as I'll see, uh, show you, or I hope I can show you that the underlying representation take, plays a huge role in the generalization. And that's something that is quite important for us. Um, and these two bullets are also related because the amount of data we can collect is limited. So we better have something that doesn't overfit to the data we have. Um, and we will um, try to model dynamics. Right? So to show you certain effects of the dynamics, um, let me uh, show you in a couple of slides. Right? Uh, but one thing that you may have noticed today when you went to this person tour, when you saw this grand hall we saw on the portrait. So in old times, and uh, in UK, old times mean thousand plus, 
if you see portraits, you would often see um, men or women having lots of um, fabric with lots of intricate folds. But this was very expensive at that time. It was uh, as a as a symbol of richness, etc. Um, we saw several in today's, but this is uh, a part of a statue or uh, selection by Leonardo, where you can see uh, he was studying the grapes of this. And of course, you have seen this picture a million times by now. Um, if you haven't tried to go uh, to Ricky and zoom in this part, and this part you see the board. It says a lot about the underlying topic. That's what we did. Um, I found this really nice picture on the, on the web from one of the artist sites, uh, this book here, that shows the, the range of problems we have in this domain. So often we have, like, if you think of sports wear, like very tight skin, like what you wear for exercise, that is essentially a texture map. If I have a very good body model, I can just crack that up for you. But then as we progressively go to looser and looser garments, then it's not just a texture map anymore. You have to get effects. And sometimes the effects are highly non linear Like the knee touching here has effects here. And that's eventually our goal, what, what we're trying to achieve. Um, so maybe the, if you were not in this domain and you see new papers coming up in garment modeling, you can quickly see which problem side they are in, like the left side or more to the right side. So, so that's a setup, right? And uh, during the talk, if you have questions, please ask them to the end of the talk, or if you disagree with anything. Um, so as I said, I will talk about three works, and it is a sequence all done with Long, Guigo, and Feng Fen. Um, and I'll tell you like how the end goal affects the representation and simplifies the problem or not. The first problem is the following. I have somehow a coarse simulation, and I'll motivate why we have a coarse simulation. So I have, I've somehow obtained a coarse model, and I want to get a detailed model. Now, here, and when I say model, in this context for this paper, I actually mean 3D geometry. So coarse 3D geometry, I want to get to a fine 3D geometry, more detail. Um, what's the motivation? Um, this argument becomes weaker every year because those are community animation comes up with faster and faster uh, 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 clock simulation systems. But there is still value in this. Like setting up these um, systems is not easy and often not available um, to novice users. But core simulations are more stable and can be done quite quickly. So if we can quickly set up that, and that's for preview, can we add details so that we can go back? Um, and again, these numbers are two years old from um, here, so you want to get the relative numbers. So the goal is going from the left to the right. Okay. Now, this works, This as you will see the solution, this turns out to be very simple once you are in the right representation. And I want to give hints why it's going to be simple. The reason it's going to be simple is I have the course simulation throughout. And even if I do frame level processing, I will sure this is already sufficient and i'll explain why this works later okay so let's let's now understand how you do it now of course we would not process image level because we want to be consistent it turns out also we we want to process in a domain that allows me to go from synthetic to real the bridge is not good so the normal thing would be gradient domain which in the case of geometry we, we work with normal maps so we have this fine map and we have the course map we, we want to take this fine map examples and go from coarse to fine. But what we can do is kind of, we can downsample or coarsify so we can get a downsample file as that. And now if you look at the distribution of the normals, and there's different ways of looking at distribution of normals, one way is to look at covariance of these features under some BDD transform, now you do clip transform. You will see that the green points which happens to be fine is distributed throughout, but the course is distributed in one side, right? some embedding. So the distributions don't match, and hence there's a visual difference. So we want to map this to a course to a fine course such that the distribution maps. And this uh, in this normal domain turns out that I can do a style match with the objective function map uh, align the um, the covariance matrices, which is a 
called the gram matrix, which you know in the picture. Okay. So it's a fancy way of measuring distribution of normals. That's what we do. So this uh, turns out to be a good problem because we have pair data available because we falsify it here. So it's, it's a very simple uh, image to image translation problem. And we can use that at runtime to get fine details. And that's pretty much it. If you do this, as you will see, the distributions now match. So if you see a mix of mean and yellow points, that's good. Um, it's almost done, the algorithm, except we also need to be aware of what material it is, is it silk or et cetera. So there's like a material classification module that you need to work. And the training data is quite simple again, because I just uh, need to work in patches. I don't need to rely on the full geometry because it's very local. So it's very much simplifies the problem. Like you can see, we even learn from this fabric. It doesn't even have to be part. So it's just like patch level. Um, and once you have the normal, uh, for those who are not in geometry, you would integrate it out to get the final surface. And automatically we get all these nice properties of generalization. Now um, let's see some examples. Um, so here, so here, and, and this I believe, uh, I don't know the exact set. Some of the game companies have already used this because they asked us questions, but I, I'm not sure if they, they have already released it or not. But it's a very simple change to have and works very robustly. And I'll come back to the robustness of it. Uh, it works with multiple layers, no problem. Uh, there can be collision. We don't handle collision here. So interpenetration is fine. This is my uh, favorite example, the next one. And look at it and look at it many times and you can see uh, the quality of it. <laughs> but I wanted to highlight one thing. Why is it an easy problem? One is we, we have the core simulation throughout and that helps in frame-wise processing in two ways. So you can work at frame-wise it doesn't build up the error because I always have the core stretch. So that's a very important thing. Um, and the second thing is there's no history to take care of. It's like all the contact with the body and the dynamics already comes in baked in in the course. Right? The, fi the fine to fine interaction is not modeled, but visually it looks plausible enough. So to summarize with respect to the three points we had, you can train with simple data because it's patch level, um, the underlying representation, normal map makes it easy to you can translate. And then uh, it, it's essentially a style transfer with paired data. It doesn't become any easier in terms of image to image translation. Like it's really image to image translation by you once you see it's represented. Okay. But there's a problem. The problem is I cannot introduce new force. So the course one should have the folds because then I add more links as well. Like it's, you can say uh, many other ways, but simply there is some thing here and then the normal map is glorified here. So it's just some sort of upper resolution, right? But it is flat, nothing will happen. So the next question we ask, which gets to the next paper is, how can we add the details from scratch? And here we also go down a bit more. We start with only motion. So I think Rachel will like this picture. It's, we only have joint movement. The colors are showing uh, which joints they are. And the end goal is I want to have the dynamic. Okay. Um, there is a trick. The trick is we, we would output appearance. We would output you the final image, but don't ask for the 3D geometry because we can't provide it. And that's the insight why this works. Because we relax the assumption, we never have to explore the problem becomes easier. And I will show you again why this happens. Okay. So the problem setting is I have this dot, so the dot with the movement and you see, and we want to put that. Um, and you can change the view. And what's the motivation? Again, this is the process. We simulate, but then we have to also render. Right? And these two processes is slow, maybe it gets fast every every year, but it's still slow. And in the design part, as soon as I make changes with new motion or camera, we have to re-estimate everything, right? And that's we are what to avoid. And we are saying, okay, the problem becomes sim simple if you don't ask for the intermediate geometry, but we can finally produce you the final results. Right? But I'm not going to decouple it. Right? And the separation makes it a bit different. 
and then you can if there you can change the view point so that's it so here you see the movement of the dots and then. okay <clears throat> how many of you have worked on some version of neural rendering I see a lot of hands okay um how many of you have worked with uh geometry and like rendering just rendering pipeline you would know right like, so in, in rendering pipeline to simplify we have a geometry we have coordinates on it this camera it gets projected there's colors that gets projected right? so it's essentially that but we what we have done in graphics over many years is we have built very good understanding what's the camera model how does the ray project how does the color project what are texture for the these are very good and uh, this idea of neural rendering comes from the following work. We have core geometry or whatever geometry it is. Instead of RGB textures, we have at each point some features. I don't know what these features are. There are some features. So instead of RGB is an example of a feature, but there are other features. And instead of um, taking the color and putting it there, there is a special function which is called a neural renderer. It's a fancy name to say a function that can be learned. So together we learn both the function and the render, but the path tracing and etc. is exactly like our standard traditional okay. But these, the important thing is the joint here. And then you can try to fit to the original image or the set of images. Okay. So this works quite well if you have given multiple views. This is not NERF. NERF is a little bit more because it, instead of normal thing, you do volume rendering and leave that for another talk. Um, if you do that, the, the most naive version would be if you go from here, you do some host things on the course, we learn the features, and we do that. Um, so we tried that um, because this, this sounds like something reasonable. But as you will see here, so the, what we are trying to do is this is undergoing motion, and we are trying to predict the final image. Um, so what we have an encoder, and now the motion encoder back to that and decode it, we get a period. If you do that, you will see the results are uh, not so good. See the results are not so good here. And let's pause here to understand what's going wrong. One thing is we are cheating in the sense we're not giving enough information to the system. We know how the bodies are, how the particles are moving. We are not giving any motion information here, and we have to be aware of that, and then we can avoid the flicker. Right now, because we don't give the motion information, yeah, this is annoying with flickering. Right? And because it can't um, capture due to the flickering, when we do the MFC loss or SSIM loss, it gets blurry. So once we can address the flickering, the images will become shorter. So how do we do this? So um, to summarize what we have so far, there's lots of papers here that we don't have to know, but there's two families. One is this type of family where you do image to image translation. Right? That's the first paper. It works great, but it, it doesn't give um, the appearance control we want. Right? Or we have these neural rendering like methods, which are good on, on working with 3D, etc., but doesn't have the motion we want. Right? So then you can't control it, and that's why we get the flicker. And what we are going to show is the last column we would have. Like when we have hours, we'll get very close to the ground truth that we see here. The main thing we are going to support 3D, so we can go across view, but at the same time, we would have motion cues and we would do the neural textures in the proper way. How do we do that? Um, I try to explain schematically, it's a little bit more complicated. We need to give motion cues. So the first idea is instead of trying T, I give T and T minus one. So I can compute now things like velocity. The product acceleration, velocity features can be computed. Okay, this gets encoded. Um, the encoding details is not important, same inside of a style transfer network, but it gets to see both of them. So it has velocity information. So before we only had this, but now we have this relative one. And we have point level correspondence here. That also helps. This is, this is also key. <laughs> And now, as I said, we are not going to produce the geometry. So what I'm going to produce is a layer for the background, a layer for the object, and then we would essentially composite 
So the top part does a layer for the avatar, and the front part, uh, the lower part does the same. And this is composited. It's not a depth composite. We know the garment part, which part of the garment is in front of the body. And this gets composited, not in a fixed blending, it's a learned blending function, and we get this kind of. And how do we supervise this? Because we don't have this intermediate to, uh, decomposition. We supervise this um, by this again, that point of the scan. Now I prefer we do it with a diffusion model where the GAN um, gets to see both the spatial context and the temporal context. So it's given uh, a chunks of image blocks with time and it can compare it with that. So not, to note that this is an important detail. We don't have this intermediate decomposition to supervise. So we would not be able to do. We have to supervise with end result. And in the, this is a common story in many of these unsupervised or semi supervised learning tricks. Um, and the reason I like this work is because you can only do this once you understand the traditional pipeline way we learn. Because we, we are trying to replace parts of the traditional pipeline using ways that we know can end up in learning this graph. Let's see how, how well it works. Um, so this is on scene motion. That means it has been trained on that. It does better work. Right? Um, you see on the right is ours. And on the middle one, uh, our result, but this is without the motion information, without the velocity. And you see it has different. Uh, those who are joining with Zoom, you would see a, a different frame rate than once in the room. Uh, so you can go to our web page to see the original video or try the code yourself. Um, and this was with the fixed features. You see the quality has specifically for it as we pointed out, but also the quality has improved. <coughs> the real test, <coughs> there's quite a bit of changes, is an unseen motion. Uh, <coughs> so um, this is the ground truth. Um, this is uh, video to video. That's everybody does now. So these two are image based, right? Translation model. Uh, this is what we did with uh, neural rendering, but using GAN for supervision, right? So that it's more comparable to others. And uh, many of you, or some of you, were working with SMPL models. So this is SMPL plus fixed two. Now, this is a subtle difference for only who are working with SMPL models. All our work, um, in none of them, we assume as said. Um, access to SMPL models, which means we don't have to fit to these type of parameterized models. Ours are extensible to other body scans directly, uh, which is an added advantage. Okay, so let's see how it works. So the bottom right is our example, and this is the ground truth. Uh, we show more comparisons as we go It makes uh, it easy to now compare in the sense, go to different cases and different garments. So the uh, same coarse garment, but you can put different appearance to train it. You can see it naturally follows. Uh, the, the middle one is quite tricky because it has this lace that goes around. Um, the, the last one is double, double layer, right? Again, no collision is handled here, and I'll come to this, um, which is a key difference. That is, so here you see that the, we, we start with the, the joints and then we predict the coarse geometry you see that the knee goes through. Right? So we're not doing any collision detection, but because we output images, we don't have to do this. We'll fix it in the rendering state. Right? So this is again achievement, which we can't do when we output it. So we don't try to fix this here, the rendering will take care of that. Right? Um, that's often uh, something I tell my students, like if you work with neural nets, it's often a problem. If you make mistakes, it has other ways of fixing it. So you think, oh, it's working, but actually uh, you have two sources of error that got canceled out uh, in, in a not a good way. You can do other shapes because it's only needs the code has to be updated and it will work. So this generalizes well. And you can also do a real, real performance because uh, joint detection works really well on this one. Um, I should mention that if you're working in 2D detection, it works very well if it's tight fitting, like here. So all the joints are visible, and also the full body is, is available. So, 
So uh, to summarize what we achieved here is um, the representation was we sacrificed output in geometry. We did the final appearance that helped. Um, that led to the representation where we can directly learn this appearance on such based to the spatial or temporal features. Um, and we could translate to unseen motion and unseen features. So that brings me to the um, final part of the talk. Uh, but as it's a sequence of projects, it's always limitations leading to the next project. So what were the main limitations? The main limitations was we had this convoluted sort of layered based representation, which works really well, but um, it's hard to tune. So if you have a different background, you have to tune it because we don't have an explicit geometry. So we can't just replace the background. It is uh, not view consistent. So by that, I mean, you have a representation where the features hanging on the, on the course geometry, plus motion features appended to that. But then if I render it from a different view, it would be slightly inconsistent. And the way to do this is if you do a matrix right style rendering, you freeze in time and rotate, and then you'll start to see the flickering. And that's cost we take. And the final thing, which we already talked about, it doesn't handle collision explicitly <coughs> because it's only done in by the rendering process. And in the work, this is uh, so that now I will transition to the last part of the work. This is the first time I'm presenting it. <laughs> so it will be presented later this year. But I think we are closest so far in coming up with a representation that we're essentially outputting uh, equations that I can run through as if I'm doing like physical animation. So we talked about, we, we heard about this force uh, is for uh, crowds and other things or contents before. Essentially what these methods are doing, it's trying to output the equations that can be plugged in, in not existing that sort of rewarded uh, animation system. And that's a great, um, advantage once we can do that, because now we can do all sorts of these changes. We can change uh, the sequence, we can change the garment type, etc. because we have learned the equation. Right? This is the grand goal, like if we can extract the, the invariance in terms of equations, right? It's not F equal to MA equations, the equation where we feed it to the network and the network learns the equation. So when I give it new parameters, it would give me one. So it's a different way of thinking, but I think uh, this is where um, machine learning can work together with graphics to, to enhance the physics process. What are the design uh, considerations should be familiar by now. We really want to be more aware of motion, and now we want to, to solve the hard case. So if I, if I put this, then I want this to affect this, and eventually to do, to do this, right? So the, here to here maybe comes in 20 things. It's really motion awareness. Um, let's talk about blend skin weighting uh, and, and uh, uh, weights have to be dynamic and I'll talk about that. And we want to do collision handling. And that, that's a part that I want to em uh, emphasize. So before we were doing cheating in two forms. First one, we said, oh, we will just close our eyes whenever collision happens. So that is the detail transfer. The second one, we say, I don't want to understand the, the neural rendering will fix it. Right? But here, we can't quite do this because if you think of loose garment, then the collision drives the motion. So I can't just ignore it. That's the boundary condition that we need to solve. It's not like a tight garment case where I can track the body. It's really, I have to find the collision and they are going to change depending on which part is in collision. So if I have a, a like you talked about this uh, Scottish uh, rope, I think we talked about that at the castle today. So depending on which knee is hitting, the flow is So how would it look? So we start with the geometry of the, of the person walking. So we have that. This is a test time, right? Uh, and then we predict the three D geometry of the garment. We look at the details, and because it's three D, you can put that texture and other things. I will not show the the texture picture anymore because that should be obvious. We have the geometry, so we can of course texture it. So that's it. 
I'll try to explain it because I, I think it's quite neat um, and we'll see how, how far I'm successful. Okay, so what we have are these two information. Let's, let's um, assume somehow we have started. So we have the garment so far, which are in the purple color. So we ignore the body, it's only the garment. And now we have three times. So that means I can do velocity and I can do acceleration. So V dot, V is velocity and V dot is the acceleration. So I can compute this, so that's not good. And I have the body at time T. So I have the garments I've sim simulated in the previous phase and my body in a new frame and I can take this and produce the garment in time T. And now uh, there is a problem because now I will move time. So this new garment becomes the, the previous state. But now uh, it, it should be the first question that to the animation community should be clear that now there is a real worry about accumulation. We can't have the fix anymore, but we, we better do something so that the accumulation doesn't happen. And we will test this uh, with, with this. Um, <clears throat> so there, this, this is the network I will explain in many stages. And that would produce this garment T. Right? So that's a goal. Now we will do this. I, I broke up this image into three, four slides showing the same information at different levels of uh, details. Now, to go from uh, here, we go through an intermediate pose, and I'll explain what it is. So we go through a T pose, which is denoted by zero, like a canonical pose. Um, and again, this is not an SMPL pose, this is just a T pose in this plan. Then we add details here, geometric details here, and then we use scaling to go through the new pose. And this to this form we come from, we know. Um, one thing that will come is how do we compute the scaling rates because these are not given and they have to be dynamically com uh, computed. That means the weights, the scaling weights have a suffix T, so they're going to change over time. Um, what happens if you use a fixed weight? We, of course, tried that at the beginning. Then what you see is, is this sort of weird bulging happening when you do this near, near joint. So it needs to do it uh, dynamically. So based on the joint position, it has to learn what's the right way. Okay, so the same idea, slightly more details. So we have the, the body at time T and we want to get this garment. Um, so this, we would, so we would create a latent scale space we compute the canonical displacements, and then we do the skinning to go here. Um, so this you saw, and this is the part, these parts I will explain multiple times later. But this figure you want to see. So what is going to be computed is this one in a canonical one, and then we transfer over. Now, as I say, the collision we have almost solved, but not completely. Let's see if I show you again here. So when it comes to this, we can get no collision on this canonical one, but we can't uh, say that no collision on the pole. So if we look closely, there would be space that would appear. And the reason it's hard is in the canonical pose, I have a fixed geometry so I can build my data structure, whatever it is, uh, once, and I don't have to worry. If I have to do every time in the pose space, it's doable, but it's super slow. So we don't do that. And I'll talk about this when it appears. Um, as I mentioned, we know the going from the canonical to the post one, we know the rotation translation that's known. Only new part is the weighting we do at the time element. And that I understood. Last level of detail. So again, we start with the body, start with the garment. This is at the beginning. So we, we know this is our training data. That's why we have data at time t. We are training an autoencoder. That takes, so this is the UV coordinate of the garment, the front and back. Right? So that's that's fixed. That's good. So this auto encoder is trained with ground truth data of what the garment is. And this is a simple auto encoder. And then it would output these features, a uh, bit like the neural features we had, but now these are geometric features, which, when interpreted with the UV coordinate coming from here, will give me the details. Okay. Will give me the details. And then um, I have these points on the body with these weights. I do 
the uh, NBS, and I'll go back to the model. Now, the weights are computed in some weighted fashion. The only thing is this row factor is like an Hennessy standard. Okay. Uh, we, we tried to learn this at the beginning, but this, there's too much degrees of freedom. So, in the end, we decided for trade off to only learn a single parameter for this RG that was much, much more robust to do. Um, and these are type of things you would have to often have to do in this context. You have to go back to the right representation so that it counts over fit. As I said, we can guarantee um, no collision in the in the post phase. What we do that is we build an SDF. Um, what to do is the collision checking in the network. So we have an implicit SDF. So if this is your uh, neural implicit field that we build, but it's built at time zero. So there's no penalty if I am outside the body, but if I'm inside, I meaning the garment of inside, then it penalizes its forces as well, right? So this is like a penalty method, but only at the canonical force. And then when we put it back together, we get the full body. Okay, so we are all done, except we haven't, this is only for the training doctor and coder, we haven't said what goes in here. That's the last thing. Okay, and now what's the goal? This part has been trained. We could forget about here. It's going to be this part. And now I have to drive to go to the latent right? code. And here I need to make use of the motion information that I have. It's a bit, a uh, few parts, but it's actually something quite simple in the end. So what we have is we, we have information from the previous uh, time, t minus one, which is latent. Yeah, the weak coordinates, so that goes in. So that's the green part, that's the easy part. Um, and then what happens is we, we take these previous three and we compute the velocity and acceleration features. So V and V dot, these are explicitly com uh, computed because I have correspondence and you compute velocity. Right? And you can use your best uh, velocity estimate or acceleration estimator. One part I haven't talked about is what happens to collision. How do I know which part is getting in touch? This you can do by uh, looking at the garment uh, with the body and say which part is near. And it's what we call a collision map where collisions can happen. So this is dynamic and it, it shows that near this part in the next frame likely collision can happen. So it's kind of, if you're in this domain, you kind of this attention layer, but it's a very explicit attention layer because I know the problem very well why collisions can happen. So over time, this red dot can move. And that gets encoded and we have to make it. But it's vaguely understandable. Okay. So the main ideas are we try to be as explicit as possible because the parts we know. So this is all good. We have the detail. Uh, we add the displacement, we have the weighting to go there. Um, we can find the position dynamically. This is what's happening, and that's getting fed in. So, all the information is now available to the network, and it decides how to use it. So, that's the, uh, the part where we don't control because we don't find the same. It, it combines it in an equation with the first order correction, and it automatically fits it. Okay. So I'm going to show a set of examples, um, and that's all the methods. I'll uh, show the examples on the video okay. um, And in each case, in all the cases, we only train with 300 frames. Okay? And I'll talk about the data sets as we go. The t-shirt example, would it be a difficult example or an easy example? That's what we learned so far. T-shirts are Right, so, that's so that's why it is first, it is easy. Good. Um, this is testing motion, so you haven't seen the motion before. We change the arm straightening. Um, and there's no correction done. It's just really the raw result you see. And the body shapes. What's happened in the body shapes? The UV parameters change, the collision map change, so the network can still knows how to process it. So it's no problem. You can do from any view, we can change the motion, everything gets updated. I'll talk about the motion soon in the next slide. And we can do this really, really long uh, rollout. Um, <laughs> this is almost 10 times more 
rollout that we have seen in any competing system, just because it's showing how accumulation of error robust it is without any correction. Uh, you can go to more friendly uh, content here. Uh, and when I say I'm seeing, that means it was not in the training data. It's only one type of motion that was used in the training data. And it's best seen in the plot here. So uh, if you see the training, we use two types of training walking and dancing, which is around here. And then this one, this is catwalk or the hip hop. These are quite different from the training data. Just showing some of them. So just try to remember the cat walk and hip hop are different from what we had before. So the next one, increasing level of difficulty is skirt, but now it's more free You know the routine by now, so I'll let you watch. The view coherence is, you don't even have to talk about that. Can render from any view. We have the geometry. You can process in whatever rendering uh, application you have. You want fancy shadows. You want ambient resolution. Everything you can get. There's no problem with that. Um, we can go more to this bodysuit. And I always did training with 300 pages of walking. That you always use the same. So now, if you see uh, near the arm, you can know use one. Um, it has never seen this body, it has never seen this walking style. Um, it has uh, uh, it has just learned the equation, so it, it can do that. So it shouldn't come as a problem. Uh, there are caveats, there's some things we cannot do, and I'll talk about that. And if you look very carefully, maybe it's not visible in the screen, you would see occasionally the skin through because we don't have the cushion, uh, the collision handle in the final time we have it guaranteed in the in the final okay <laughs> so again this is what we summarize that uh, even in uh, quite a bit new um, scans this work so how does it compare with other methods there's a lot of working in this domain a lot of them are in uh, graphics conference a lot of them are in um, vision conferences and also ML conferences so some are uh, Segra, Segravatia, some are um, PR and some are uh, near it. So this is all, all over the place. And the green highlighted ones are the ones we compare against because they are the uh, newest in this domain. And the right one is ours. Um, and as you can see that uh, it doesn't overfit as in others. Here, the company pattern sort of gets baked in. Um, and here, uh, it is here. One thing to be very clear that we don't know how this algorithm works. We send the data to the authors, they came back with it. So it's any hyperparameter it doesn't they did anything to the authors. Uh, but they um, they also looked at our results um, and uh, they tried to adjust, but this is how far you get. Um, this is, you can also extend it. This is uh, almost work, but it doesn't work exactly as a state. What you can do is if you have multiple layers of carbon, we can first um, do the noise inside those layer, then treat it as the body, and then do the garment on top. It's almost almost works, but doesn't work as I will explain a bit. But if you look visually, this is how it looks. So you uh, do the first layer of simulation, and then you now the yellow garment becomes the body. Right? So you, the point that defines on that, and then the purple one. Here, but now you start to see this uh, see through to, to this uh, common thing. Okay. Um, now we'll talk about why this was. So, as I said, one of the limitations is there is residual collision, and maybe you have ideas how to speed it up so that we can do the proper one. Um, we know how to fix it, but it's just not fast enough to do it within the system. We need like a fresh idea there. The second thing is, is this is a bigger problem. It's we don't model garment to garment interaction. So when we get multiple layers, then one they are pushing each other away. Right? So this this needs to be modeled, but we fix the first layer, so we can't get the inner one. I mean, 
and it goes back to this next thing we want to do now is even at the new fabric type we want to really capture this data i was talking to some of the folks here capturing fabric with proper tracking itself is a problem and we have some approaches there but it doesn't work as a resolution to um, so in, in summary but i hopefully convinced you that depending on what you want the problem can be quite simple where you treat it just as framework um, translation you get details very good uh, it's, it's almost trivial to implement you can sacrifice asking for the explicit geometry and uh, sort it out by combining the geometry and appearance but this is the grand goal which which we have we're closer but not really there is you, you try to learn as much of the equation as possible so that you continue to have the one which really truly remains uh, generalizable except for the last one all the other uh, papers the code is available last one should be available in a couple of months maybe even one month we just uh, finish the final version of the paper uh, we will we'll now focus on adding a bit of documentation so uh, with that i'll be happy to take questions thank you Actually, the um, uh, clothes, so, um, but I'm interested in uh, why you chose to involve UV space and a lot of what you were doing with with predictive meshes. I wonder if you think that you could just go straight to the system mesh. Um, so the question is, I don't know if uh, others can listen to uh, those on the call. The question was, why do we use UV? space versus using the original matrices. This, this is good. Uh, this is a very valid question. The reason is if we do it UV space, then it becomes an image. And then you can eventually, we didn't do it yet, we can eventually have CNNs that learns with some domain matrices. And then you can have a different garment type and apply the same CNN further. Um, that's why we wanted to do it is possible to stay in truly mesh domain and do with uh, graph neural networks. The whole thing becomes a bit more complicated. So as this is a, a possible direction where I don't know whether we would do CNNs or we would do graph networks. Um, but that's, that's, that's our uh, reasoning why we ended up doing uh, going through UV. So these combinations we don't use convolution yet, but it, it's set up in a way we can very easily do it. So the reason we don't, there is a slightly complication because of boundary, right? So CNNs tend to cheat by knowing how far the boundary is. And uh, when we get closer to the boundary, there's wrapping. That's why we started with MLP first. Thanks a lot for, for your presentation and very impressive work. Uh, I was wondering, as you are using, you showed that you are using the canonical pose, which is like the standard T pose, which is somehow as far as possible as the animation, uh, as the pose you have in yeah. the animation, especially for the arms, and uh, wouldn't have a canonical pose, which is closer to some of the pose of your animation, wouldn't that help to alleviate a little bit the collision you might, uh, you might uh, encounter at first? So um, question was, why do we choose this T pose as a canonical pose? Because that makes the problem unnecessarily hard. <laughs> why this problem is. It's, uh, it's a point that I hadn't thought about that much. But now, if I think about it, there are a couple of things we can do. One is we can think of having a few canonical poses. Yeah. Uh, so it's a bit like in, in uh, nearest neighbors, you would have landmarks yeah. and you find for that. Um, and then fetching from the canonical pose, we have to do a selection. Mm -hmm. and think of um, doing this one. I, sometimes I, I would hesitate a bit because it's it, it becomes a little bit harder to debug the networks, right? Uh, if you add beyond a few. Um, so I don't know the 
answer to your question, like in the sense, what would work? This would be my immediate sort of thoughts of what we can try because we need to test it. But that is a valid point. We are making the, uh, the difference is more than the need to be sure. Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much for the comment. I think, again, the third one is very, very interesting. I think it's a fun set of negative work. But one thing that I noticed is probably quite similar to the first question. So there's a very smart use of the kind of economical uh, government space. I'm just wondering, um, would there be some sort of topology, well, when we come to topology of COVID that cannot be well sent by this state? So say for example, if you see this kind of very interesting clothing in a fashion show um, with hoses everywhere, or maybe with some snitching that is not actually easy to be divided into pieces, um, will you still be able to send it using that? Um, so yes and no. So first, if there are holes, there would also be holes in the space. Right? Often when you talk about fashion and others, there, there might be very thin connection yes. um, that we need to be very careful about because that makes a very long and important connection, right? holding two parts together and other things. Uh, so that uh, as even an MLP base would not work uh, well because it might miss in the pixel resolution. And there it goes back to the question that it's, it would, I would prefer to have like an explicit mesh geodesic part um, link that would transmit the information. Again, the UV space makes things very easy to do at the first version, just because everything's regular. Uh, but as soon as you go to um, one ring kernels, things start to be a bit more harder to, to get right in the first place. But that's a good point. Um, so these are very related questions, so I'll answer them together. So the first question was, um, how about materials? And are we aware of that? Uh, in, the, in the first work, we had the material classification, and then we didn't have here. Uh, it is possible to do um, a conditioned version of both setups. But the reason we dropped the material classification is uh, one can theoretically set up, and we could do that. But because we are working on the synthetic data set, their material classifications are not quite as real as this. So when we, with the grand overview, we have also talked like if we could capture this, if we really have true materials, then it could make sense. So it is possible to add a cl classifier and say conditional generation. I can show you results, but I don't think those would be like scientifically correct results because it, it would be different, but it, it doesn't mean that we now know how to handle different materials. So that, that could be the first part. Um, and, and then um, the second part, yeah, it is conditioned. So that would be the first way to try it. Like the response would be conditioned, right? So it would just be another uh, conditioning variable to add. Uh, but we need things to be different. But one thing I would say, this was I think asked today morning, like can you distinguish between two people or 100 people, right? Uh, whenever things get close, like what's called fine grain classification, then the problem is much more harder. I'm just curious about the uh, smart city model that you showed at the start of the presentation. What was your own um, scanning process? For? <laughs> so this, this was done, we had a grant from, from Google. So these were done by combining information that you can get. So there, there's multiple information you get. So there's open street map. Uh, Yoga's could know about this. So this is um, 
many city, cities just release this shipping point, right? Um, in London, uh, this survey is extremely, has a rich history. So almost any building you can get the building mass plan. And that means where the buildings are, right? So this is uh, what Google shows, but that's not fully correct. But in London, uh, you can get proper one. And then we had street view images that we used. And then um, we had satellite images, all publicly available images we could get. And the whole point is how do you fuse this? So the name of the paper, if you want to look up, is Franken Gan. Uh, Franken because we are <laughs> putting part as in the, in the Pakistan to different part. And the consolidation of the fusion was done in a way to do this. But I, I would imagine that there are maybe more richer material available depending on the city or but probably now I would do more like a, a direct neural rendering capture rather than trying to decompose geometry and material. Uh, hi, this idea of course simulation uh, plus this AI is a pretty good. And I'd like to ask uh, how much computation does the each model need? Uh, is it possible to implement it on a smart, uh, smartphone and a mobile GPU? So when you say, um, so in terms of computation, um, there are three parts that I want to talk about. One is, if it's intelligent data, data generation. And I'm grateful to Marvelous Designer who allowed us, they gave us copies of their um, Raman simulator to use it. NVIDIA has Flex, which you can also use, but we just happen to use Marvelous Designer. So that's one part. Uh, that one, I will do a liquid processing. So, so this is done a little bit. Training one would also do it um, on our uh, GPUs, right? But this, this is not like we're not talking about uh, GPUs, many GPUs. And then for the inference part, for the testing time, this can be on on phones now. Because once this is done, uh, you can uh, do this trick that you restrict the number of depth players on the MLPs. So and once it has been trained, you would have a polynomial function that can be evaluated on. The Yes, sir. I have a question with respect to uh, constraints. So, for example, if I think about this system being used in the context of a virtual try on application, right? I have to preserve, let's say, the area of the textile and stuff like that. So could you comment a little bit on these role of constraints? So, um, <laughs> Just, uh, just to understand the question. So when you talk about area preserving, this is... Um, yeah, in this case, I mean, the world area would be, let's say, if you uh, discretize with triangles, right? Yeah. So just the sum of the area of all the triangles. And now, if you, for example, add wrinkles or stuff like that, yeah. right? So you are violating, let's say, the initial okay. area. So the question is just, I mean, that's fine, right? To violate it in this context for this particular application. But I mean, if we have constraints which are important in our particular application, so how do you think about yeah. it? Yeah, so, so this is a great question. So when we, as I said, uh, <laughs> I try to be very clear, when we add this detail, uh, this is just frame level, no guarantees, looks cool, and we're happy, it's very fast, right? No constraints here. But when you go to the mesh level, which is extreme right, you can start putting in these constraints because now we have an area you can measure the Jacobian, you can compute the area, you can do this, you can add a constraint. Um, it is true that we would like to have the constraint for our wrinkles, but um, if I have this, then near the joints here, there is stretching, and this is a virtual dryon, very important. They want to find how the stretch factor is, especially in tight climate. So yes, in the mesh domain, it's possible. In here, it's not possible, but it's also we're conscious that Maybe here, um, if someone asks for it, we would say this is not the right domain. You want to work on the right, uh, on the right most domain. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have any additional questions? Maybe we have time for one more question. Okay, and maybe I will ask the last question. So you mentioned diffusion networks on one slide. You just said that nowadays we would do it with a diffusion network. So how do you see diffusion networks in the context of the work you presented today? Um, how many of you have heard the term diffusion? I think I would expect everyone. Um, 
when you hear diffusion versus diffusion models, that is being taught, taught in generated models. How many are aware of that diffusion? Okay, that's a good one. But for those who are not, so diffusion, we talked about if we draw, drop the ink in water, it diffuses the diffusion equation and whatever. But in generative models, when we talk about diffusions now, that's diffusing one distribution to another. So someone asked the question of multimodality in the input. This is where a diffusion model would be good. What GAN doesn't allow, it doesn't give uh, a probability distribution sample form. It just says these are good images of cats or people or whatever it is, but it doesn't say, it doesn't answer like these are likely cats or likely cats. So there, when we did the generative models for, uh, for, the, for the wrinkle patterns, we'll, we can, if we do diffusion based, we will have these are likely wrinkles, but these are low right. No likelihood wrinkles, but that can also happen. Right? So it would be it will allow us to sample based on what are the most common types of wrinkles happening around here versus what are like uh, happens once in a while. Okay, I see. Then let's thank the speaker again. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much, Eloy, specifically since you are not, let's say, from the animation and simulation field, you really saw how we could actually raise an interest in the audience. So this, I think, it was uh, very impressive and uh, we've been very happy to see your research. Okay, so I would like to hand over to the chair of the upcoming session. I think it's uh, animation and simulation, I guess, one. I think we are good on time.